John Covert, uh, you could be his bio in the, in the program. Uh, we, we first brought John uh, to this conference last year, and his presentation was very well received, so we asked him back. I've now heard him a couple of times, heard him up at CSU's forecast uh, late last year, I believe, but uh, really fascinating uh, information on lot supply and how that will impact uh, growth along the front range. So please join me in uh, welcoming John. Thank you, Chris. Appreciate that introduction. And Tom, you have way more courage than I do. That is for sure. Talk about politics. And I uh, uh, had the benefit of listening to the group in front of me. Um, they did a fantastic job, the icons of, of real estate here in, in Boulder. And one of the gentlemen was talking about how, yeah, these forecasts are just terrible. I hate looking at these forecasts. And, so I quickly went over to my slides and I removed my forecast. <laughs> uh, so I'm not gonna show you my forecast. Actually, I will show you my forecast for housing starts. So yeah, Chris and Biz West, thanks for inviting me back. Last year, um, I was part of the keynote presentation um, during the lunch hour, really enjoyed it. I'm gonna hit some of the similar highlights that we did this time last year to kind of give you a sort of state of the union for the home building industry. For those of you that don't know who I am or who Metro Study is, so we're a market research and consulting firm for the new home building industry. We've been doing this for about 40 years. We're in markets all over the country. I started the company here about 15 years ago in Denver. Uh, and we essentially, kind of the, for you old school real estate professionals out there, you'll love this. Our methodology to collect the data that we collect is actually go look at every single lot and every house in every new home subdivision every 90 days. And I'm not exaggerating that we actually do that. We actually get the recorded plats sent to us from each county electronically every month so we know where all the future projects that are getting entitled. We track all that. And then once development takes place, we're looking at the status of every house every 90 days. So we're not relying on permit data or deed record data to give kind of a health of the home building industry. We're relying on our proprietary research that looks at every project up and down the front range. So uh, just to give you a sense of relativity, there's about 450,000 future lots that we are tracking in the 11 county front range region. Just let that sink in for a second. Right, multiply 3.4 persons per household, right? We've got capacity to grow. It's gonna obviously be influenced by different jurisdictions and different regulatory pressure and different influences that have to do with housing stock and lot supply, but we've got a lot of future lots out there that we're tracking. Not all of them are going to see the light of day sooner rather than later, but um, we'll get to that. So I want to talk to you a little bit about, not specifically the Boulder area, I know that obviously a lot of the, the presentations today focus specifically on Boulder or Broomfield. Um, I'm going to kind of back up a little bit and talk to you a little bit about what's happening in the home building industry um, throughout the Denver metro area, if that's okay. Um, but I want to talk about some of the influences that are really driving home building today in, throughout the Denver market. So first thing, growing, but we're only halfway back as I think uh, Dr. <coughs> Tito um, put up on a slide in terms of permits for the Denver metro area. We'll highlight that just for a quick second here. Um, there's a real strong outlook for economic and demographic growth throughout the Denver metro area. And that's really what's driving a lot of our household formations. It's strong demographic growth. It's just sheer numbers, right, that we're talking about. Builders are starting to focus on that sub $400,000 product. And if you remember from last year, we were really talking about the average home prices accelerating very, very quickly, as Tom mentioned here specifically in Boulder, to a point where um, it was almost out of touch for the majority of household incomes in the Denver metro area. So we were leaving a lot of first time home buyers and entry level buyers behind. Um, and we show you some of these um, average home prices, you'll understand why, but builders are now figuring out a way to get back in touch with that first time home buyer. Especially difficult since the other session previously was talking about construction defects, we're not building a lot of condos in the metro area. So they're shrinking the house, smaller lots, smaller homes, and they're going further out, right? Those are your two alternatives, get denser or go further out. And so builders are doing that, so we'll talk about that. 
We got a lot of constraints still in the industry today, holding back, meeting all that demand that's out there that Tom was talking about, right? We're underbuilding the market today. We've got tight lot supplies, we've got tight trade labor issues. That's some of the difficulty from permit to close for getting these homes delivered. Uh, we've got escalating land and costs of development, as this session before me was talking about. We've got incredibly high home prices, the highest they've ever been in this market. And we've got declining purchasing power without even rates moving up yet, right? So there's a real risk for that first time home buyer, entry level buyer, particularly here in the county of Boulder as we've got very little affordable product that's out there. And then I'll give you, I will reluctantly give you our forecast for housing starts for 2017 <clears throat> at the end of all this. All right, so I want to focus a little bit about our economy first. Um, I don't know if we've, uh, at least in two sessions, I, I kind of bounced back and forth uh, this, this morning. I don't know if we talked too much about what our local economy is doing. Again, not just Boulder, but the entire Denver metro area, we're creating a lot of jobs here. Right? It's attracting a lot of in-migration into our market. We're adding about 40,000 net new residents to the Denver metro area three or four consecutive years. Um, ending in now 2016 will be another year, of another 40,000 people net increase coming to Denver metro area. Most of those are younger. 24 years old and younger, right? First time residents into Colorado and primarily most of them are renting in the city and county of Denver. They're going to where the excess, not the excess, the, the largest supply of rental stock is right now in the city is in the city and county of Denver. But anyway, the, um, the job creation that's happened over the last four years, we've exceeded about 3% job growth in the Denver metro area. Really strong employment growth. And that's expected to maintain that same pace through next year as well. So we're adding about 50,000 jobs a year each of our last several years. So really incredible. And the, all of the sectors of our economy are contributing to this job creation that we're experiencing now, right? There's not a, there's, the manufacturing sector is even flat. We're not bleeding jobs out of the manufacturing sector like we were in the past. But notice on the far left-hand side is the natural resources and construction sector. We've added about 12,000 jobs trailing at the end of September here. That's about a 12% growth rate in the previous 12 months. So incredible recovery on the construction <coughs> sector. We now have more construction sector jobs than we had at the previous peak of the market back in 2006. So the, the construction industry is starting to pick back up again is now kind of wind in the sails of our local economy. As many of you know, a robust housing market really adds to our economic growth, and that's now obviously occurring. And the trade labor issues that many, some of you have been grappling with um, have been really holding back this industry for building more homes. You know, what might normally take four months to build kind of a typical, let's call it a $450,000 house, you know, 2,500 square foot home might take four months normally when the market's in balance. Now it's taking eight months, nine months to get that house delivered. So it really suffocates the housing stock right now. But the trade labor issue is starting to finally soften up a little bit. This, uh, anecdotally, some of our builder clients have told us that it's getting a little bit easier to find trade labor, even though it's still a constraint for the market. Unemployment rate, obviously very, very low, or 3%, just slightly above 3% uh, unemployment for the Denver metro area well below the U.S. unemployment rate of about 5%, which means our consumer confidence is really high. Part of that is rising home prices, repairing equity in our homes, job creation that's taking place, right? So consumer confidence is very, very strong in our, in our region. The rental market's very strong. Uh, there was some concern a year ago, and I think I actually addressed uh, this group about a year ago about there was some concern that the apartment market was overbuilding, but when you look at how strong our economy was and how many people we were relocating here to Denver, and the majority of those were younger renters, right, looking for rental options, um, we knew that, at least in our office, we suspected that the vacancy rate would fall back down to what many consider a full occupancy for the metro area, around 5%, and rent rates, as you can see from that black line, continue to accelerate. Uh, up about 6% over the year. So it's, a, it's slowing down a little bit in terms of rent rates. We've had double digit increases the last couple of years, but rent rates are still going up and they're obviously the highest they've ever been. 
So the rental market's really strong. And what home builders particularly love is that they, these are our first time home buyers, right? We're sort of replenishing the pool of first time home buyers. A lot of people, as we know, have been delaying purchasing a home, and that's why our vacancy rates remain very stable. But these people will eventually buy houses. We know that. The uh, resale market. Um, this one is just incredible. So the gray bars that you see here are actually the total volume of resale transactions trailing 12 months ending in September. So you can see we're at this kind of high plateau, right? I mean, you would think in our economy that it continues to grow, it's one of the best performing economies in the country, that we'd see more resale transactions. Actually, year over year, sales are down 1%. But look at our listings, the red bars there, right? The listings have stayed flat. Usually in a rising economy, we see listings go up, right? As people repair equity in their homes, they move out to buy the next house or the bigger house, right? But look at the number of listings in a red bar remained very, very flat the last few years. So our months of supply is about 1.7 months of resale listings in the market, right? That's way below what we consider equilibrium around four to five months. So that's one of the reasons, as Tom indicated, tight supply is pushing up pricing in our, in our market. We actually think this environment is going to stay about the same going forward. Right? We'll still see high volume of sales transactions, but we're going to see really constrained market for inventory. And I don't know, a couple of you in the audience may have heard me talk about what I've now coined the Julie Index. This is my wife. Um, it's usually not very relevant to have your sample size be one person and that one person is your wife, but in this case it kind of works out. So uh, let me explain. So Julie uh, loves to go with me on the weekends to go visit new home model home projects. She loves to walk through the models with me. So we were on a project um, south metro area. This is probably five or six months ago. We happen to live in Highlands Ranch. So we've lived in there for about 13 years. So we go visit a project and she's like, wait, the base price of this house is how much? <laughs> um, and it's probably the equivalent of what our house is worth in Highlands Ranch, let's say. But we live on a 10,000 square foot lot, finished basement, so all, all in finished square footage is about 4,300 square feet in our house. Right? We've got all the landscaping done. The house we went and visited, which is probably worth about what our house is worth, just the base price, 2,500 square foot on a 5,000 square foot lot, no landscaping, no finished basement, right? So I think the market is, well, okay, if I list my house to sell it, where am I gonna go? What am I gonna get for equal or better value? So in that regard, we think this market's uh, stumbling a little bit in terms of people just deciding to stay put. And that's why we're seeing reload, or not relocations, remodels at their highest level that they've ever been in the state of Colorado. People are deciding I'll just finish my basement or redo my kitchen, right? So we're gonna be in the kind of this high plateau, we think, for sales volume, but limited supply, which is gonna keep prices pretty high. All right, so there's our price. I'm not gonna rehash some of the price increases that we see on the resale market. Here's the new home side, just new home single family detached. Not counting Boulder County or city of Boulder, the entire Denver metro area, the average single family detached home price for a new home is 517,000. That's trailing 12 months, right? That includes Adams County, Arapahoe County, Douglas County, Sitting County, Denver, right? Very expensive place to buy a house now, right? So this is part of the reason why the home builders They've been gravitating toward that move up buyer that has been there in the market for both new homes and resale over the last few years. But they know they've kind of left that first time home buyer behind. And now they're going to start to focus on that entry level first time home buyer. I know this is really hard to see, so I'm not going to explain it in too much detail. Just this is population growth going forward. This is the State Demographer's Office. Really great website. I encourage you all to go to that State Demographer's Office website. They've got really great interactive tools that you can see and you can download it by county, by city, projecting forward. We're going to add, let me just make sure I get this number right. So the Denver metro area, we are right here, just under 3.1 million people in the Denver metro area. Fast forward uh, 24 years, 25 years we'll call it, just 4.3 million people estimated to be in the city, the metro area, right? Another million people moving to the Denver metro area. Or, and part of that is population growth, right? I mean, it's, it's 
the changes of the components of change are births, outweighing deaths, of course, and then in net migration. But this area is going to grow, and we still have to grapple with how we accommodate this growth that's out in front of us. So really strong growth, and I know we've sort of beat this topic to death, but millennials make up the most significant population cohort in the Denver metro area today and going forward. So the red bars represent just five years from now. So you can see the majority of, of our population in the Denver metro area is going to be in that 30 to 45 range. Right? The oldest millennials today are now buying houses. Right? So they're roughly 30 years old. So the builders now, again, recognize this, uh, that this wave is coming, and they're trying to figure out how to do it. All right, so let's um, let me back up a little bit into our um, our housing survey. So seven county Denver metro area housing starts. You can see the trend lines here. The starts are in the red. The closings, these are our observed closings that we track in the market lot by lot, house by house, are in the black. So you can see we're really just halfway back to where our previous peak was. Now, we know that the market was driven by a lot of speculation back in 2004 and 2005, and it's a lot more organic stability, <coughs> organic growth going forward here. Uh, but we think we've got a long runway in front of us over the next few years for home builders, especially if they can figure out this affordability component, right? Making product a little bit more affordable going forward. So I, one of the things that I think is interesting um, is that the, the resale market has really, has really um, uh, garnered kind of the mind share of the buyer out there over the last, this last cycle, right? Let's call it from 2005 at the previous peak. Of all the transactions, the gray represent resale, the red represent new home transactions. About 25% of our transactions historically have gone to the new home builder. Right? During the recession, of course, builders were not building homes. Prices of the resale market dropped considerably, so obviously the home buyers kind of gravitated toward the resale side. Well, now that's changing a little bit because inventory is so tight on the resale market, right, it's really hard to find a house. So the home building industry is really trying to capitalize on the buyer that's out there, the prospective buyer that's out there that can't find exactly what they want. So usually the new home market's kind of the release valve of housing stuff, right? So if the resale market's kind of stuck because we don't have a lot of inventory out there, the home builders have to go add more inventory. So they're trying to do that, but they've got con some constraints, obviously, to do that. But you can see that black line represents the market share of new home transactions relative to all the transactions in the Denver metro area. We think that that's going to get back up to 20, 22% here over the next three or four years as home builders really start to get this engine moving, particularly if they can add more attached product. All right, so annual starts by county, um, and this is all product combined, so townhomes, single family homes, condos, the you know 3% of all the condos built. Actually, I should back up here. By the way, uh, there were about 3,000, at the peak of the market in 2005, we built about 3,000 condos in the Denver metro area. This year, we'll build and deliver probably about 400 condos, just to give you a sense of relativity of what the real issue is, especially when we're talking about home prices accelerating the way that they have. And a lot of young potential buyers moving into our market that really have no place to go. All right, so you can see here, there's a couple counties you can kind of focus on. This gives you a kind of a six year look back of market share of housing starts by each county. So of course, Douglas County is our biggest county in terms of market share and housing production. But you can see that year after year, market share in Douglas County is kind of declining. It's actually shifting to more of the affordable, quote unquote, submarkets like Arapahoe County, but particularly Adams County. Notice how Boulder County has stayed relatively flat, eight, nine, 10% market share year after year, right? So if this market grows to 13 housing, thousand housing starts, right? We're talking about 10% of that for Boulder, roughly. Uh, Broomfield County has gone up a little bit and declined over the last five years overall, but that's really dictated by one or two projects. Anthem in particular kind of drives that whole, uh, that whole market area. So here's um, a couple of the issues that we're facing here. So where do the entry level and first time home buyers go? 
So this is just the base price of single family detached homes offered in the Denver metro area. So this uh, $300,000 product and below, virtually non-existent. So uh, it's our estimation in our group that home prices for single family detached homes, new homes, will never see home prices again back at that sub $300,000 price point. There might be a few exceptions here or there, but the homes are gonna be very, very small on very, very small lots. And usually they're gonna be out in the suburban rig. But we're never gonna see home prices at that sub $300,000, at least to the same volume, probably ever again. So 67% of our home starts are base priced at $400,000 plus, 27% at $500,000 plus. And you can see that trend continues. This is just year over year. If I were to look at this trend going back the last decade, so the red trend, uh, the red bars to represent that sub $300,000 price point. So look, it wasn't that long ago. 2010, it was over 50% of our home starts were base price below 300,000. Right, it's completely disappeared for a lot of reasons that we talked about in the beginning, all those constraints, right? Costs, regulatory pressure, materials costs, development costs, type trade labor, right? All that stuff that's factoring in, um, pushing that product out. And uh, granted, 2010, remember that was first time homebuyer tax credit, right? So we had a lot of entry level, first time homebuyers buying homes in. But just go back to the peak of the previous market, 2004 and five, we were at 50% then too. So we didn't have a lot of that different sort of public policy driving the market in place. The gray bars represent that sub $400,000 product. So this is where we think the market's actually gonna do kind of an about face this next year or two, because the builders are all, all these publicly traded home builders that are in the Denver metro area, and there are a lot of them, right? We have a pretty high percentage of all of our housing starts are tied to publicly traded home builders. They have the capacity, right? They've got the, they've got the capital, they've got the wherewithal to introduce different product, go out, buy land, entitle it, um, develop it, smaller lots, smaller homes, and still make margins, where the private local builder has a tough time doing that. So we're gonna see these guys, virtually every one of these builders, if you were to go talk to them, have introduced or about ready to introduce smaller, footprint product. This is stuff going on 35 foot wide lots, 1200 square foot homes, right? Um, so it's, you know, de-spec stuff, but it's still, the design of the product is trying to reach that first time entry level buyer whose attitudes are a little bit different about how a home should be designed. So they've completely gone back to the drawing board and redesigned all this smaller product that lives really well. So it'll be interesting to see how this is accepted. We think it's actually gonna be widely success, successful and accepted in the market. So again, to give you a sense of relativity, the public builder market share in the Denver metro area is about 60% of our home starts. So if you look at the, the markets that have a higher percentage of publicly traded home builder activity, surprise, surprise, right? Southern California, Vegas, South Florida, Phoenix, Washington, D.C. Those are the five markets that were kind of the epicenter of you know, when the housing collapse occurred. I'll stop there with any sort of commentary, but it's interesting to think about, right? That's where the public traded home builders are really the heaviest um, and the most influential in the market. So if we look at the public builder market share of that sub $400,000 product just in the Denver metro area, you can see it peaked at about 76, 77 percent, right, of all that product. Now it's slowly been declining the last few years here because builders have been focused on that move up buyer that's been so active in our marketplace the last few years. We think now that that pendulum is going to shift back toward that first time home buyer, entry level buyer that is now active in our marketplace, but they're having difficulty finding stuff. The builders are going to figure this out. So we're going to look for that percent share of. $400,000 and less product to go back up, but it's going to be heavily concentrated in that public builder space. All right, so uh, a few other slides here. Um, so I wanted to give you a sense of relativity of where kind of this north metro, um, and specifically Boulder County and Broomfield County, kind of stack up to where the top producing submarkets are for single family detached product in the metro area. So again, that north Broomfield. Um, that's that top blue bar that you see there, the Longmont market 
obviously, and then the Southeast Boulder submarket. And these are our top 20 submarkets for single family production. But that Southeast Boulder submarket, that includes like Louisville, Lafayette, the Boulder side of Erie. The Weld County side of Erie is the fourth one down, the Erie Frederick Firestone to Kono submarket. So you can see that's kind of a high powered submarket. And this is um, this gets back to our presentation that we made last year, if you remember, if you were here, we talked about really there's gonna be a lot of growth that gravitates up that North I-25 corridor for a lot of reasons. One, pricing pushing east out of Boulder. One is we've got the infrastructure in with 470 and I-25. We've got access to employment centers um, that the South metro area doesn't necessarily have. We've got a lot of capacity to grow. There's a lot of future ground out there. And we've got more affordable pricing, right? I mean, not just Boulder, but if you cross the county line into Weld County, we've got a lot of more affordable priced product. So that's why that Erie Frederick um, submarket has grown so quickly over the last four or five years. And we see this trend really continuing. A lot of our models that we run in our office based on long-term population growth suggests that that North I-25 corridor is where we're going to see the highest rate of growth in population and thus household formations, thus potential housing starts activity from a rate increase, a percentage increase year over year than any other submarket in the Denver metro area, including, if I back up here, Parker at the top of the list, you can see Castle Rock's really high at the top of the list, Arvada, some of those really strong, powerful submarkets, right, that perform year after year after year. The percentage growth is north I-25 quarter. That's where we see the strongest growth going forward, if we can continue to accommodate it. Here's our year-over-year -year percentage increase of starts. Uh, so Longmont, North Broomfield, you can see Southeast Boulder down at the bottom um, actually lost a little bit of share, but that's probably mostly deal with Steel Ranch kind of winding down, right? So since we don't have a lot of high volume stuff in the, in the Southeast Boulder Park, Louisville, Lafayette, the Boulder side of Erie, um, we don't have a whole lot of projects. So one project starting or closing can really influence the percent increase or decrease in a submarket. All right, so a couple quick things. Um, just to give, again, give you kind of a snapshot of what's happening in the industry. So this is the, um, the number of homes that are actually under construction. So you can see that that number is around 4,500 homes in our most recent third quarter survey at the end of September that we counted that were under construction. Sticks are up in the air, our foundations in the ground. That red line is months of supply of under construction inventory. So obviously it's going up because the market's going up, right? We've got more and more homes under construction. But we're double what we consider to be months of supply equilibrium. So that has everything to do with the trade labor issue, right? It's just taken us longer to, from permit to foundation pour to actual close and delivery of that house. So the industry is being kind of stretched out right now. So it's not allowing the industry to grow as much as we needed to based on the high level of demand that's in the marketplace. So we would be worried, all that under construction inventory is going up and up and up and months of supplies going up. We'd be worried if finished vacant inventory, so these includes the spec homes. These are homes that are complete when we drive by them and who is actually living in that house. We'd be worried if that black line was going up and up and up, right? But it's not, staying very, very low, well below what we consider to be equilibrium, right? So for example, back here in 2006 and seven, right? This black line started to go way up when you go above that, what we consider equilibrium for the market, incentives and discounts start to materialize at the sales offices. Uh, and under construction inventory was still going up, right? So we're not in that environment today. Very thin inventory on the new home build side as well, which is gonna keep pricing high. All right, so months of supply of finished vacant inventory by those top submarkets, you can see Southeast Boulder, no surprise, at the very bottom of these top performing submarkets in terms of how much spec inventory is sitting out there on the ground, almost non-existent, right, which indicates really strong, healthy market, which we all know. And then lastly, uh, vacant developed lots. So this is the other major constraint for home builders today, as Chuck Bellick from Community Development Group was talking about earlier. Right, this is a this is a really difficult time to get lots entitled, get them developed, get them 
um, out in the marketplace uh, for the home builders that are trying to grow, right? We've got demand out there, but as our founder of our company has famously said, you can't build a house without a lot. Think about that for a second. It's true. I don't know if you knew that or not. So we need lots. Um, we have a 14 month supply of vacant developed lots in the metro area. The, the gray bars represent the production lots in the market. So those are lots that are 7,000 square foot or less. 14 month supply of lots when normally the market should be around 20 to 24 months. So think about, and that's just the, kind of a blanket generalization for the whole metro area. It takes, let's call it, you know, in Adams County, you know, in terms of zoning, annexation, entitlements, development, probably two years to get a project moved through uh, the entitlement process. Boulder County, I don't know, you know, four years, three years, five years, anybody's guess, right? It's, a, it's really difficult. So when the market's trying to grow, we've got all these people out there that want to buy homes, but we can't get lots delivered fast enough. It really holds back the sort of the, the machine, right? So the market's kind of moving forward and kind of fits and starts um, right now, which maybe is not such a bad thing for the home building industry. Kind of a artificially keep them kind of modest and not sort of driving off the cliff like the home building industry can do occasionally. Um, so lot supply is really, really tight right now, which keeps lot pricing really high, which keeps home pricing really high at a time when we're already at the highest home price we've ever been. Right? So you can see where it kind of trips up the system a little bit, and it all starts, in our mind anyway, with lots and lot supply. So very, very tight supply of lots. That's just the volume of lots by submarket. You can see Southeast Boulder, obviously not a lot of lots out there in Louisville and Lafayette in the Boulder side of Erie. Uh, and then months of supply, of course, is very, very tight for all of these top performing submarkets. You know, the only up there above two year supply is Johnstown Milliken. There's a couple of smaller projects that are coming online, uh, but there's a lot of growth that's taking place in that Johnstown Milliken submarket. Those lots will get absorbed very, very quickly. And then I'm not going to go through home prices. Tom already did that a little bit, but I, what I do want to show you just to kind of drive home the point here. So again, this I don't have City of Boulder prices up here. These are our top 20 single family detached producing markets for housing starts. So Lakewood, of those top 20, the top um, average home price um, annually going back in the last 12 months at the end of the third quarter, about 690, 680,000. Southeast Boulder about five hundred and seventy thousand, but look at the look at the submarkets on the bottom of this list: South Central Weld County, Greeley, Wellington, Johnstown, Millican, Windsor, Central Adams, Aurora Central, Erie, Frederick, Loveland, West Adams. So that's Thornton. Right, the bottom half, that's North Metro area. Right, it's generally more affordable, particularly on the east side of I twenty five between sort of Highway seventy six all the way over to. I-25, and that's where we see a lot of growth occurring over this next cycle, what's called the next five, 10 years. It's just more affordable, they've got more capacity to grow, the infrastructure's in place, there's access to different employment hubs. Again, Parker and Castle Rock will remain top producing submarkets, much higher price point, but it's just dip more difficult to access employment centers from Castle Rock than it is up in Thornton. So there's a lot of reasons as to why we think this North I-25 corridor is going to remain very strong going forward. All right, so some conclusions. Colorado and Denver metro area economy remain near the top in the country. I think that's been well documented, not just by us, but we know we've got strong employment, low unemployment, heavy in migration. Home prices are really strong right now. A lot of uh, people that want to move to Colorado, not just consumers, but a lot of capital that's moving to Colorado for um, different opportunities. Household growth is going to follow the swelling millennial population that's now starting to spill out of the rental market. Either they're living in their parents' basements. Anybody living in a parents' basement? Anybody have kids living in their basements? <laughs> they will be moving out eventually. I'm a testament to that. Eventually it does happen. Or they're doubling up, right? So we know a lot of that's going to spill out into the marketplace eventually. Those strong, the resale market appears to be flattening with persistently low inventory. So we think we're going to remain in this kind of high plateau environment for the resale market with very low inventory. Home prices are going to still accelerate, but maybe not double digits like they have 
uh, in the past few years. We're going to stay high. Um, and builders, as a result, are going to adjust to all of this. And they are, very quickly. There's a lot of new product that's coming out. Highly recommend you go visit some of this project, some of this product that's coming out uh, for these builders. Uh, we're going to see more and more townhome, paired product, duplex product that's entering in the market. It's going to take the place of condos since we're not building a lot of condo activity. So here's the forecast. All right, thank you. No. <laughs> no. I'll show you real quickly. Uh, so we talk about this forecast with our builders a lot. We actually, I know this sounds crazy, we project out 10 years what could happen. Obviously, that's just insane, right? We have no high degree of confidence or predictability of what we think is going to happen 10 years from now. But that's how far out our home builders and developers are looking. They're just trying to create scenarios and manage risk, right? But this is just the next year out. So the, the black diamonds that you see here, that's a percentage increase year over year of starts. So you can see in 2012, we went up 54%, then 22%, and then we've kind of remained at this high plateau of 17, 16, 18% increases year over year of housing starts. And this red line, this is attached product, right? So remember when I said we were building all those condos back here? We were almost 40% attached for new home production in the metro area, 40%. It's incredible. We were building 3,000 condos. So what is what has actually increased this market share of attached product? It's been townhomes, duplexes, paired product. That's really become, it's gotten a lot of traction in our marketplace. We think there's going to be more and more of that that's um, coming forward over the next couple of years. So we think we're going to build, we're going to end this year, 2016, around 10,700 home starts. And we think we'll have a kind of a repeat next year that we did this year in terms of percent growth and we'll build around 10 to 12,500 home starts just because all of those constraints that i was talking about earlier are still going to be in place next year okay even though the builders are going to shift down to that lower price point the volume isn't going to change appreciably um, that we saw at the higher price points so we think it's a great year in front of the home builders this next year margins may be squeezed a little bit uh, because again, that first time home buyer, entry level buyer, uh, they might not finish the basement. You know, that, that percentage of options and upgrades for a $400,000 house looks a lot different than a $600,000 house or a $700,000 house. And that's where builders make a lot of their margin. So if they're gonna refocus back to that lower price point, margins are probably gonna go down a little bit for home builders this next year. But all in all, they'll take it. It's a really strong year for the builders. All right, so that's, that's it. Thank you. All right, thank you, John. Uh, we do have a few minutes for questions. If you want to have questions for uh, Tom or John? Yes, sir. Uh, John, so we talked a little bit about the price ceiling, and um, you know, what are the signs of a price ceiling? Do you think you've gone through it, and what would it look like after we go through a price ceiling? Yeah, so the question was uh, price ceiling. Um, what are some of the signs that might indicate that we've gone through the price ceiling? That's a really good question, Rick. What we tell people is you don't know you've gone through the price ceiling until after you've gone through the price ceiling. <laughs> um, so it's really hard to predict, but we have some indication that we think that we're actually bumping up against the price ceiling. Part of it is the number of households that can afford, the, the, looking at the household incomes, and the number of households that can afford, let's say, an average home price in the Denver Metro area for new home is 517. So the, the household income required, let's say, 10% down and all your taxes and all that stuff, is about $125,000 income, rough math. Well, there's only about 20% of our population, households anyway, that have that kind of household income to support the average price of the home that we're building today, right? So it's just a, it's just a number. There's not the percentage of households out there earning that kind of income that it's going to allow us to continue to grow the same volume at the same price points that we have been. And that's why the builders recognize it. And that's why they're trying everything they can to kind of get down that price spectrum because they believe anecdotally, generally, that we're bumping along the price ceiling right now. Again, it's not to say that wages aren't going to push up our prices a little bit better because wait, we're, wages are increasing in our metro area today, so that's certainly going to help. But we think we're at the price ceiling for a lot of the reasons we were talking about. Yeah? 
But yeah, uh, John, so you made the mistake of telling us you do a 10 year forecast. <laughs> and Tom provided us with the Trump interest rate forecast. How do you see that affecting your 10 year forecast? I don't even know if I should repeat that question. <laughs> so it was about Tom's you know, kind of summary of what is anticipated to potentially happen with rates given Trump's policy that's enacted over the next four years and how that impacts our forecast that we make for housing starts. The easy answer is it doesn't. We don't, we try to factor in rates into long-term forecasts but we're not in, at least we think today, we're not in a rate-driven market. Even if rates go up 100 basis points, we think there's enough power in our economy to overcome that, especially if wages continue to go up. So we do look at that. Long term, it's so difficult to figure out what sort of policy changes um, in DC in terms of you know, different president and administration coming in, how that impacts rates. So, I know that's a non-answer. We just, it's really difficult. So we, we, tr we, we sort of put it off to the side and sort of say, what if? But we try to look at what's happening to our local economy here. Tom, I don't know if you want to add to that or not. Um, sure, so I think interest rates aren't going up. I don't think they'll go up to eight and a half percent. That's too fast and just too high. Um, but I do see uh, yields on 10-year treasuries going up if, if Trump gets any of what he wants. And the fact of the matter is that households need more income to finance this $500,000 house at a 6% or a 7% rate than they need at the current 4% rate. So there's absolutely no doubt that it will lower that 20% of households having the income needed to buy the median new home to a much smaller number. Yeah, and, and just lastly, um, we do factor in purchasing power. If we sort of add up all of these components that go into that, rates are certainly one of them. So we anticipate purchasing power, not just 10 years from now, but next year, 2018 is gonna get tougher, right? It's gonna go down. Purchasing power is going to go down. Um, even if rates stayed flat, we think purchasing power is gonna go down just because costs continue to push. We have time for one more question, I think. Do you have one, sir? He offered it to Tom, and that's okay. what I was gonna ask. Okay. John, what, what counties do you see being almost built out? You know, not just health land, but yeah, so the question was, what counties do we see almost built out that don't have a lot of carrying capacity going forward with future lots or finished lots right now? We don't. Uh, you know, it's a, again, that's a kind of a tricky one to answer. I mean, the easy answer is, well, of course, Boulder County, right? It's a really supply-constrained market. It always has been. So that's why its market share, as I showed you, has remained relatively constant. Because developers figure out a way to get you know 100 lots added here, 100 lots added there. It just takes the the timeline is just so stretched out. The most constrained sub market, the most constrained markets, um, actually even more so than than Boulder at least today, is actually city and county of Denver for single family detached product. Yeah, okay, Green Valley Ranch, that's a unique case. Uh, Denver Connections is a new project that's starting right across from Pena Boulevard and County Road 56 or 56 Avenue. So that's a village homes project that's starting about 700 lots. And Stapleton, you know, is about, you know, they're entering their final phases now. So they're probably, probably four years away from building their last house in Stapleton. So they're probably another year and a half away from their last developments taking place. So after that, you know, city and county of Denver is really tight. So it's going to be more infill high density stuff that gets built in the city and county of Denver. But aside from that, it's the suburban ring, Douglas County, Arapahoe County, Adams County, that represents about 70% of our home starts. So for those of you that think suburban development is dead, it's not, not the case. That's actually where we think more and more market share is gonna be headed in the future, especially since we have the infrastructure and the capacity to grow. So there's a the majority of those future lots that I said that we have out there are in those three surrounding counties. All right, well, that uh, concludes our time for the, uh, the keynote uh, luncheon presentation.